El Camino Real District of the United Methodist Church of the California Nevada Annual Conference. And I want to bring you greetings from our bishop, Bishop Warner Brown. And I also want to greet you in the way that, that, that I would say, and it's kind of a call and response greeting, okay? And so I'm going to say God is good, and you're going to say all the time. And then I'm going to say all the time, and you will say God is good. You know this already. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God, God is, good. is good. God is good. I bought my own amen for it. This time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I um, want to preach to you from the book of Esther. Chapter 4. And hear these words, bits of chapter 4. When Mordecai learned that all had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went through the city, wailing with a loud cry. Then he went up to the entrance of the city gate, for no one enters the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. Most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Mordecai learned what Esther had said, Mordecai told him to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the others. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews, but for your father's family, you will perish. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the people to be found in Susa, and hold the fast on my behalf. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, I and my maids will fast also. And after that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your gospel once again. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. And give me words that will bring new life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I come to you knowing that in all likelihood I'm not supposed to be here. In Grace Cathedral? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> But I'm here today standing before you, not because I'm five feet eight inches tall, but because I stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before me. There were two little boys who loved to play by the sand lot and where sand was being dredged out of the river. And the little boys went down and they were playing in the sand, having a good time. And one day they didn't come home for dinner on time, so their mother sent word looking for and by the time they got there, they saw their two little bikes standing outside the fence. And they went in and all, they looked all around the sand and all they could see was one little boy up to his head, up to his head in sand. And they dug around him real quick and dug him out. And finally, when he could breathe, he got enough air. They said, where is your brother? And you see what happened is that sand, sometimes when it mixed with the river water, became like wet sand. And they got stuck down in there, and the sand just started coming down on them. And the mother said, where is your brother? And he said, I'm standing on his shoulders. I'm standing on his shoulders. We come here as a people who are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. We come here as a people who stand on the shoulders of folks who migrated, came through Ellis Island, who ran across borders. We come here as a people, I come here as a preacher, as one standing on the shoulders of poor folk from Louisiana and Texas.
stand on the shoulders of those who pick cotton in the field from Cape Seed to Kent Seed. I come standing on the shoulders of those who made the middle, middle passage nameless men and women who made it belly to back. We stand on the shoulders of kings and queens in Africa. We here, we are here, standing on the shoulders of those who sacrificed for us for such a time as this. Those who had made a way, who went without to do for so that we might be able to live and have our freedom and our life, we come standing on their shoulders for such a time as this. You might ask, what kind of time is this? This is the time when we turn on the news and we have to ask ourselves, which shooting are they talking about? Is it the college shooting? Is it the shooting in the movie theater? Is it the shooting at the elementary school? Is it the shooting at the regional center to help the developmentally disabled? We live in such a time as this where we have to turn on our news and hear about the Zika virus, the H1N1 virus, the bird flu, and we understand we are a global community. We live in such a time as this where it seems like we are headed at warp speed to a fiery destination, all traveling in a handbasket. Amen? <laughs> I also want to challenge the writer of Ecclesiastes when when the writer says there's nothing new under the sun. After I watched that presidential debate earlier this week, <laughs> I wanted to say, excuse me, I don't think you've seen this yet. <laughs> this is just a whole new kind of craziness that, we, that we've never seen before. So how do we get back from such a time as this to becoming the people of God that God calls us to be? There are breadcrumbs left for us in Scripture on how to get back to God's beloved community. One is in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that says, if my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and turn for their wicked ways, then they would hear from heaven and I would heal the land. That means that we can come back from such a time as this if God's people become God's people again and turn our faces back to God. How do we do that in real life? What does that look like? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> what that looks like in real life, for me, is one of my role models. Shirley Chisholm, who when I was one years old in 1972, ran for president. And I remember my mother saving a button from her campaign. And I had it on a little teddy bear in, in, my, in my room. And even inspired me to be a political science major in college. But her campaign slogan was, unbought and unbossed. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> if we are going to turn back from such a time as this and get back to God, we have to be unbought and unbossed. When we look at the pages of scripture, we can see Mordecai and Esther living in such a time as this where their world is spinning out of control and the people are at risk of genocide being annihilated. And we see them in the spirit of God, their creator, being unbought and unbossed and able to save a people. If we want to be unbought and unbossed, we have to first do one thing, and that's we have to be willing to disrupt the status quo. If we're going to be unbought and unbossed, it is not business as usual. You look at Mordecai. He sat in the city gate, ringing out, crying out, help us, Lord. This is not okay. Where are the voices today that can say, look, this is not okay. We can't have business as usual. People are dying. People's lives are being taken from them. Children go to bed with nothing to eat. We must disrupt good enough and say, wait a minute, no more status quo for us. We don't bow down to anybody except for God. And I decided a long time ago, although I am a, a agent of our bishop, I decided a long time ago that 
I was going to disrupt the status quo. And I decided that even if it cost me my job, as long as I could say, would you like a venti at Starbucks? As long as I know how to do something else, I was going to speak the truth for Jesus Christ. And I was going to be unbought and unbossed and disrupt that status quo because we can't keep going like we're going. And we need voices. Your voice. My voice. To speak out on behalf of those who are voiceless. We can be like Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the mothers of the civil rights movement that said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Aren't you sick and tired of turning on the news and seeing another shooting? Or we can be like Rosa Parks and say, no, 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 not today. I'm not moving and giving up my seat. We can disrupt the status quo and be unbought and unbossed, just like Mordecai sitting out in the king's gate saying, this is not right. And if we want to be unbought and unbossed, like Mordecai and Esther for such a time as this, we have to call all God's people together. This time we find ourselves in is an ecumenical time. It is not a time for you and me and the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Muslims and the Jewish people. This is a time for all God's children to come together as one. Because when the children of God come together with one focus on changing this world and stemming the tide, powerful things happen. About 15 years ago, when I was pastoring over in Oakland, yeah, it's maybe 20 years ago, okay. <laughs> I was in my mid 20s, and I was going to visit a woman who was in the hospital. She just had a heart attack. And it was late at night, and this woman was a uh, Norwegian, Scandinavian immigrant, and her husband was a cute little Italian guy. They were about in their 90s, early 90s. And I went to go visit them in the hospital. And I just love them. They're like parents to me. And I show up with me. And usually, when I don't have all this stuff on, I've got my baseball cap on, and my blue jeans, and speakers, or whatever. And I, I bought to the hospital like that, right? And I get there, and the nurse tells me, I said, I'm here to see Mrs. Bojell. And the nurse says, no, it's after this an hour. She can't come in. I'm a pastor because we pastors have privileges, right? We, we can go in after visiting hours. So I said, oh, I'm a pastor. And she looked at that round face and that baseball cap and those sneakers and said, uh-uh, you're not a pastor. And I said, no, I'm in, I really am. She's the only family is allowed right now. And I was trying to explain to her because I really wanted to see her and I could see Betty's little feet uh, moving back there on the bed. And she was a small little woman, but she had a big husky voice. And all of a sudden, when this nurse is giving me the blues and not letting me in, all of a sudden I hear Betty's little husky voice come around the corner and she's saying, you can't come in unless you're family. All of a sudden I hear, she's my daughter. <laughs> and the nurse looked at me, brown, and then looked at Betty, Norwegian, I couldn't believe what she was seeing, but what she didn't know right. is that we were all God's children coming together, and we share the love for the same Christ. And there weren't a black Stacy and a, a white Betty, but we were all God's children together, and we were powerful together. And when we can come together in our world, not looking at the things that divide us, but the things that keep us together, then we will be able to be unbought and unbossed. That is what Esther did when she called all the people together in Susa and said, we're going to fast for three days. What would the world be like if for three days we all, all our children, just focused on God? Not on what was different about us, but what was the same. What if for just three days I was in Methodist and you were in Episcopalian, but we were just all God's children? Do you know what happened the last time we did that? Pentecost! The last time people focused on the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came down, and the world was changed forevermore if we gathered the people of God. Oh my goodness, it might look like last night when God 
God's people are working together as a team. It might look like the warriors versus the thunder. And it's overtime. When all God's people come together, it may look like the score and your team is going to lose. But if God's people come together for such a time as this, then you're in overtime. One day, two. And it's tied up. And the whole team is the body of Christ is working together. And then when six tenths of a second left, there comes Seth Curry. <laughs> Nothing but net. Nothing but net. And the game is won for the glory of God. And all God's people could come together, focused on the same goal. For three days they came together and did nothing but get on the court, unbossed and unbossed. You see, Esther didn't use her place of privilege to be a place of comfort, but she used her place of privilege for being an agent of change. And that is what the gospel is calling us to do, to use the places and the gifts that God has given us, to know we are standing on and unbossed and be that agent for change. Now, if you want to know how Steph Curry did that last night, you need to look at his soul. Before you look at the soul, you need to look at this soul, the S-O-L-E of his shoe. Because on the sole of his shoe, he has a scripture on all the shoes he wears. And it's Philippians 4.13. Mm. I can do all things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. He gave up a deal with Nike because they wouldn't let him put his faith all on right. his feet. And so on all of his shoes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And friends, that's the last part of being unbought and unbossed. You have to be tenacious. You have to know who you are and whose you are. You have to be like Queen Esther and have the confidence and the faith to say, I'm going in there with the strength of my brothers and sisters beside me, standing on the shoulders of my ancestors. I'm going in there to the king. And if I perish, I perish. But I know the one who goes with me. Yes. And I know who goes before me, and I know that God is with me. We have to have the kind of tenacity if we're going to be unbought and unbossed and says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to have the kind of tenacity that says, for man some things are possible, but with God all things are possible. We have to have the kind of tenacity that Jesus had when he got up out of the grave and was resurrected because we are a resurrection people. We are a people of hope. And when you get to those situations that make you feel less strong, less able, less tenacious, you can remember Esther putting on her crown, straightening it before she went into the king. And you can remember her tenacity as you channel the spirit of Jesus Christ within you to say, if God be for me, who can be against me? And then you can channel that inner five-year-old, because some of us have that inner five-year-old. It's right on the top of you. Get out. And we, we can channel that inner five-year-old that says, look here, you're not the boss of me. I'm on God's side, and I'm working for God. And if I perish, I perish. But we live our lives for the glory and to the kingdom of God, unbought and unbossed. I can imagine Queen Esther putting on her crown, remembering the words of the Invictus poem, saying, out of the dark night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeoning of chance. My head is bloody. But unbowed, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul, unbought and unbossed. Or you can be like Harriet Tubman when the slaves were making their way to freedom, who said, if you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, if you want to be unbought and unbossed, keep going. Brothers and sisters, keep going. Unbought, unbossed, unafraid, only bending our knee to the power.
power and the will of our God in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the words by Maya Angelou. Out, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may talk me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Out of the hut of history's shame, we rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, we rise. I'm the black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling high there in the tide, leaving behind nights that wonder of terror and fear. We rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. We rise unbought and unbought for such a time as this. We rise bringing the gifts that our ancestors gave. We are the hope and the dream of a slave. Unbought, unbought. We rise. We didn't know her mother had been, uh, had been associated <laughs> with the she church. Was, yeah. Really, I mean, it was, it was, I just, I, we knew that she had been with Joan, mm -hmm. and I had a special memory of Joan because my dear friend E. Williams uh, was, uh, had a service there 31 years ago, mm -hmm. more than 30 one years ago, so I thought whatever Joan is doing has got to be great. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know if any, any of you know about that church, you know, Methodist, I um, mean, uh, post, post. Mm -hmm. but now, since then, she got elevated, she was <laughs> <different. elevated>. <laughs> <laughs> she, got, she got promoted to a new position, and she's now the super, the district superintendent of the United Methodist Church, so how about that? Yeah. Nobody eats. No, no, until no, no, she, no, 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 and I've been a member here. Bill has been a member. Where's Dorothy Bates? Dorothy She's Bates. She's our most senior member. She's been here since the 60s. Then there's Ron. Ron, hold your hand. Oh, you want to just Ron, hold your hand. He's also been here since the 70s. And where's Bill Claire? With a in a non-romantic way, broke her leg, her toe. Where is she? Hiding Claire somewhere. 
But I just kind of wanted to uh, uh, introduce some of the members of the um, Grace. And then um, Reverend uh, Randall. Who's heard the license? Okay, the opera's back on. Now, Randall's been so supportive. It's the first time we've ever had a whole month of Black History Month here. And it's been just, we had a forum. Last week we had Joe, Ron, and Richard. Richard, hold your hand up. A greeting from Apple and Joe, Richard Allen, and Joe's week. Wow. And that was beautiful. So, we're just so happy that all of you are here and all of your friends, and uh, we'll have to take you to real life one day. No, this is not. I forgot to mention one famous person. Reverend Gardner, you want to say something? Well, did you want to say anything about your other friends? You said you had lots of friends coming I do. Today, so. I do have lots of friends today. I, I can't call you friends. They're like family. And so if you're... If you're uh, what's the, bit, the blend between friends and family? Family? Okay, amen. If you're family, just raise your hand. And so I just praise God that, you, that you're all here, and I'm just honored to be here. And thank you, Jordan, for inviting me, and Randall, and uh, Malcolm. It's just a beautiful day, and so I, I thank God for the day, and I had no idea that my mother-in-law had preached here wow. until this morning when I asked my sister, Pam, I said, did mom preach here? And she said, yeah, in the 90s. And so it was, it's just kind of a coming full circle moment for me and looking out and seeing so many uh, beautiful old faces and beautiful new faces. Um, I just really feel the presence of God. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair for that, uh, but we also had Dr. J, Ron Johnson back there, Richard Compion, who helped to lead the, the poetry workshop last week, uh, Alma Robinson Moses and Toye Moses are at the Democratic State Convention, so they're not with us today. Heather Millar helped to organize this, and she helped to organize, there you go, she also helped to organize that banner that the children made. Uh, Father Tyrone Folks is not with us today. But then we've got Deacon Doe Yates, who is not only a great deacon for this church, but a marvelous cook. And Amen to that. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm going to get up because that's the actor. <laughs>